All right. Um, so how is it going with the assignments? Who has finished the second one? Who has started the second one? Great. How far, how far are you with the second one? Halfway through? Just started? OK. Uh, so we have two more to go. Um, and then there is a project. You can, of course, reuse some of the things that you've been developing for the labs in the project, of course. Um, the next one for the um, labs is um, assignment three, lab three. And it will be, uh, I will put it after the class. And it will be about sensors. I haven't, um, I haven't decided exactly what we should do. Uh, what we've done last year was we had a device, mobile device, um, and then we you use accelerometer uh, to know how flat the device is, if it's tilted one way or the other, and then you had like a little uh, circle in the middle, and if you tilt the device one way, you kind of, uh, you know, direct the, the ball or the circle that direction, right? And then you can kind of control the movement of the ball or of the circle around. Um, it's kind of a nice one. It uses an accelerometer, but there is a lot of accelerometer based um, apps out there and Google has their own kind of similar project for doing that already. Um, so we either build a little bit more complex things like maybe with some holes like you probably have seen those games where you can have a ball and it kind of you try to avoid kind of falling into a hole. Um, the other, the other one I was thinking of was to use the microphone and to do something with the sound. Um, so we have kind of a, you know, a number of possible sensors that we can play with and do something simple. Um, so microphone is, is one, but with microphone, you have to do quite a lot of uh, signal processing, like of the actual sound. All right. And then you have to use some library or something for that to like detect the beat or to detect the volume or to, to do something, um, which, yeah, I mean, we could do, but we would have to find some um, external libraries to, to help us with the processing of the, um, of the sound. We discussed already the, um, somewhere before we dis discussed the possibility of using OpenCV uh, for processing camera feed. Um, yeah, I don't know where it is. Um, so there is, we already have some examples for processing video um, and doing some something with the camera. It's another sensor that we have. Um, but I don't know, like if you have some uh, ideas of what to do with sensors, um, then let me know. I'm using sensors, I'm, I'm uh, flying on a paraglider and uh, on a paraglider, it's really important to know if you're going up or down. It sounds kind of that you will always know, but actually you don't. Like if you're sitting in a harness and the air is kind of uh, bouncing you around, you actually don't know if you're going up or if, if you're falling down. Uh, the movement is kind of subtle and it's very important because if you're going up, you want to stay in that spot so you can kind of go up, you know, to, to the cloud base. Uh, but if you're falling down, you want to kind of uh, press like you have like a speed system which allows you to kind of fly forward faster and you want to avoid the sinking, right? Um, so there is a sensor on the mobile devices, which is a pres pressure sensor. And the pressure sensor is sensitive enough to know if you're moving up in the air or down. It's so sensitive that if you take your uh, phone and you put, put it here, there is a different pressure than if you take it up. Right, so you can detect the change of the pressure between, you know, a meter of the height already, um, and it's quite fast as well. So you can detect while while you fly, you can detect kind of uh, with quite a, a a good precision whether you're moving up or or going down. Um, GPS, for example, can be used as well, but GPS is very inaccurate and it's very slow in detecting the z axis uh, changes. So what we will do today, we will talk a little bit about sensors. And if you have some ideas of what would be a cool um, uh, application for sensors, let me know on Discord or an email, and I will kind of update the, the lab. 
otherwise we come up with something ourselves which you may like or not uh, so there is kind of an added advantage of proposing something so what do we talk today about is uh, sensors yes <clears throat> so how many human se senses we have how many senses humans have yep yeah good answer so i don't know them all neither uh i know that some scientists count up to 22 right so um it's pretty impressive we typically kind of focus on five right so we focus on sight hearing taste smell and touch um so those are the traditionally well-recognized ones and they have a very fancy Latin sounding names. Um, and as you pointed out, you, you know, a lot of scientists kind of uh, working in that space, they say there is much more to that. Um, so how many sensors your mobile phone has? What it can sense? Five things or more? Depends on the phone, Depends on the phone yeah. Right, so we have kind of a picture here. Um, so we have a number of various, oops, sorry, of various sensors. So I really like, oops. Oh, come on. Yeah, it's. Come on. So there is uh yeah, th these ones. So those mechanical tilt ones. So it's a little tube with um uh, elect um with kind of a metallic material inside. And if you tilt it, the, it's like sand. It kind of rolls to one side or to the other. And by changing the geometry of that kind of a metallic material inside, it changes the electromagnetic properties of it. So you can detect how much it's tilted, right? It's kind of a mechanical uh, device because the tilt actually changes the, um, the distribution of the material inside it, right? And you can have it either as a kind of a, like tubes or you can have it kind of a build in together. So that's kind of a clever way of detecting how something is tilted. Um, you have the infrared sensors, infrared diodes. Um, um, you have an electronic compass, um, pressure switches, touch switches, um, magnetic sensors. You have a kind of electronic compass with two uh, coils detecting the difference of the orientation of the of the compass. Um, so there is lots of uh, different sensing uh, technologies which um, we developed and we miniaturized to be able to put into the phone. Um, so here is a list of typical sensors that uh, most of the phones have so microphone keyboard uh, some sort of a di digital pad or a touch screen uh, wi-fi it's a it's a sensor camera uh, video camera gps accelerometer or gyroscope uh, digital compass what's the difference between the gyroscope and accelerometer yep Yeah, rotate. yeah, that's right. So one detects rotation, and the other one detects the change of the acceleration, right? Um, we have um, the accelerometer detecting the uh, gravitational field, like the um, the g-force which 
operates on the phone, pointing downwards, uh, but it also detects the movement, right? So if I accelerate the phone and then decelerate, it kind of detects that. It records what is happening with the phone. Um, and gyroscope is more about the rotational changes. Uh, temperature, air pressure, I discussed it a little bit. Uh, touch sensor, proximity sensor. What is the proximity sensor we used for? And where is it? Yeah? That's right. It's usually next to the camera, somewhere on the top of the phone. And it basic, basically detects if you have the phone next to yourself, to your head. So when you're talking on the phone, the proximity sensor is used to turn off the screen off. And when you go off your head, it turns the screen on in phones that it works. And some phones, it doesn't turn it on again. So like I, I have this Android phone and then it sort of properly dims it. And then it takes it out and it's still dimmed. You have to touch it um, to have it undimmed. Uh, magnetic, magnetic field, um, gyroscope, yeah, we, that twice. Um, RFID and near field communication readers and Bluetooth. Um, so this is kind of fascinating because the mobile devices, because of the sensors, they are quite different to uh, what you do with your typical laptop, right? So as I'm saying, like, uh, for example, for paragliding, it's really cool. You just put, I have this kind of a Velcro here. I put it on my dashboard and it works like an onboard computer. It tells me the map because I have a GPS here as well. So it tells me like where I am in the, above the ground in, in space. And it also detects the lateral movement up and down. Um, it kind of works as a navigational uh, device. You have to observe the, um, the flight zones as well, like they are where the planes are flying. So you have to avoid the commercial altitudes of which are kind of dedicated to either uh, commercial planes or to the um, military use. Um, so it kind of tells you in X, Y, Z coordinates of where you are and where are the you know, flights uh, zones and so on. And it's accurate enough that you can use it instead of any other device. Uh, it's accurate enough in terms of GPS readings and it's accurate enough in terms of uh, altitude reading that you can get, you, you can basically use it as a navigational device. Um, <clears throat> so um, on Android platform, you have access to all those devices and this lecture is kind of divided into two parts. The first part is kind of talking a, a little bit about the theory and various terminology that we used and how they work. The other part is actually programming wise of how you use the sensors. Um, and it, it is quite neat. Android uses quite well engineered uh, setup. It has a so-called um, manager, which manages access to various sensors. And then you have access to those sensors and you can register a callback for getting notifications when you know, values change. Uh, and it is a very typical pattern for interacting with a, a, a range of different sensors. So we have uh, on Android platform, we kind of divide them into three. Um, we have motion sensors, which are about uh, what happens with the phone. So where is the phone in space? What happens with the phone in space? Uh, how the gravity operates on the phone? Uh, and how the phone is being moved around? We have the environmental sensors. So for example, the pressure sensor, um, uh, proximity sensor, and so on. Um, and we have the position sensors. So position sensors are like what is the actual position of the device in space. Um, it is, um, so you may say, um, what's the difference between motion sensors and position sensors? Well, um, they kind of have an, a little bit overlap, but they are also more complex in terms of the position. So they are usually software based and they combined multiple physical sensors to establish of what the position is, right? Um, we'll talk a little bit about it in a minute. So, <clears throat> as I said, um, sensor framework on Android is quite well engineered and it kind of follows um, a typical pattern of you either requiring a particular sensor to be present on the device, otherwise your application cannot be installed on that device, or you 
can install the application on any device and then from your application you will check if particular sensors are available or not right so you have those two choices up front you can like for example if you're developing some game which requires a gyroscope and a camera you can specify in the manifest file that the phone needs to have a gyroscope and a camera if the phone doesn't have it then the game cannot be played right uh, but if you want to enhance your game because there is a gyroscope you can detect it while once the app is already installed and then if there is no gyroscope maybe you can control by touch and if there is you can control by tilt or you know rotation of the device um, so then you once you do this first part the second part is you can check what are the capabilities of the sensor so different hardware components have different capabilities and what is important here what is usually the the most important one in case of um, um, positional or orientational uh, uh, sensors. Like, let, let's say accelerometer. What, what can be the parameters of the accelerometer? Any ideas? Yeah, power usage. What else? Accuracy, exactly. So accuracy or error, right? Error rate. Uh, what else? So the power uh, consumption is not reported. Um, to know what the power consumption is of uh, accelerometer, you would have to do your own test, right? You can turn it on and off or use it and then measure how much battery drain there is, but it's usually not reported as a parameter. Accuracy uh, usually is not reported neither. Uh, you would have to get it from the spec of the hardware. Uh, what is reported in the context of accelerometer is the refresh rate. Like how quickly can you get new updates about the acceleration, right? So the frequency at which you can pull the data from the sensor. That is programmable and that's uh, usually provided in, in the uh, software interrogation of the capabilities. Um, the upper one is the highest frequency that the sensor can deal with, and that's kind of provided by the manufacturer. Uh, most good ones have 100 or over 100 hertz. Uh, the less um, uh, of lesser quality sensors, they can have maybe 60, 80 hertz, uh, depending. Right. So it's how frequent you will read the updates. Um, it influences the battery consumption, of course, right? So if you're reading the updates very quickly, you will be very sensitive, like you will have a very instantaneous feedback uh, from the phone, but it will also consume more battery. Uh, if you don't require that, usually you should pick the refresh rate, which is, you know, sufficient for your application use. Um, <coughs> so that's you know, that's the, the, the third point, kind of a minimum rate at which you will acquire the sensor data. So what is the um, typical um, usage pattern and what frequency will be sufficient for detection, right? So if I'm playing a game and I'm using the phone to steer the car, I want as fast as possible. I don't want to turn the, the, the phone and nothing happens, right? I want it to be as responsive as, as possible, at the highest possible rate. Uh, if I'm detecting a tremor, we, we did a, a study um, a few years ago when we were detecting how much somebody's hands shake. Right, So you hold your phone in your hand, and if your hands don't shake, it's very stable. Uh, if your hands shake, your phone shakes. So we can detect how much the phone shakes right, using the accelerometer data. And then we want as fast as possible as well, because we want to be able to tell exactly what is the shape of your handshaking, right? Um, and then once you identified the rate, you can register and unregister the sensor listener. 
So the listener will uh, be notified every time there is a new data. Uh, for, for example, for the acceleration, it will give you X, Y, Z acceleration in three uh, dimensions, the values. And every time there is this uh, frequency update, it will kind of give you new data. So it will kind of call, call back your callback all the time, right? Um, and it is important to, as I said before, that there are two types of sensors. Some sensors are hardware-based and some sensors are, are software-based. In terms of the frequency, let's say uh, the phone manufacturer says uh, the updates for the acceler acceleration are the highest one is 100 hertz, right? Uh, will you will get the readings one hundredth of a second every single time? Not really, right? There is also a bit of a fluidity in terms of the updates. It would be nice if the updates are exactly one hundredth of the second all the time, very precisely, because then, for example, for some processing and so on, you can assume certain accuracy, but that's not the case. There is always plus minus an error, right? So the updates will happen, roughly speaking, 100 times per second, but they will not be uniformly distributed across the spectrum. So you will have a little bit of errors uh, accumulating while you get your, uh, your data back. Sometimes it doesn't matter, like for example, for controlling the car, you know, if you got, you know, one millisecond later or one millisecond earlier or something, it doesn't matter, you still just react to what the user input is. But if you, for example, analyzing a tremor, if you analyzing what is happening with the phone or a hand shaking, then it's important to know what that is because um, it, you know, it, it shapes the curves of what happens with the shaking, right? Um, all right, so if you go, um, <clears throat> if you go to the um, Android um, help files, they will uh, have the specification of all the types of the sensors that Android platform supports. And depending on the API level and depending on the hardware, those sensors may or may not be present, right? Most phones have accelerometer. Uh, they will have the uh, gyroscope, either hardware-based or approximated from the accelerometer and so on. So most of those uh, sensors here uh, will be present on most of the phones. But as, I'm, as I was saying early on, you, if you want to have the guarantee, you will have to uh, specify that in the manifest file. Otherwise, if you're checking it during the runtime, you may or may not get it back, right? Uh, so some sensors may or may not be present. Uh, and then if you go to the, um, to the uh, uh, page, you will kind of always see the updated list of all the uh, sensors. So for example, there is there was an ambient temperature before uh, in um, uh, they, from API level 14, they replaced it with temperature, right? So most, again, most phones will have it. Uh, you will have the, the temperature. I think they changed it because it was a little bit confusing. Like on most phones that I've tried it, the temperature is not really the ambient temperature, it's actually the temperature of the battery. Uh, so you would have to have a baseline and you would have to calculate what is possibly the ambient temperature uh, around the phone based on the baseline that you have established. Uh, it also differs like if I'm holding the phone in the pocket, what is the ambient temperature? I mean, you know, it will be close to my body temperature, right? Or higher if, if the battery is generating heat as well. Um, so th that's why I think they, it, you know, the word ambient was kind of confusing, so they removed it uh, because it is some form of temperature, but you don't know exactly what it is, depending on where the sensor is and the case and how you're using the phone. <clears throat> um, there is relative humidity as well. Um, yeah, a number of, um, of sensors that we can uh, play with. So, depending, as, as I said, depending on the API level, uh, most of you will probably work with the later Android phones. Uh, so you will most likely have all the sensors which are kind of listed here. Uh, on, on early on, they were kind of introduced as, uh, as the platform was developing. So it is kind of interesting because they, uh, the list, 
you know, I checked it yesterday because it says Android 4.0, which is quite late, quite uh, old already. And I thought they've updated the list, but it seems they not not much has changed since then. So the list is still only up to Android 4.0. All right, so um, we will go quickly through some of the sensors uh, and kind of uh, highlight some of the key key points, right? Um, so this slide has been prepared like, you know, um, probably eight years ago. And back then there were more camera phones than uh, digital cameras out there, right? These days it's probably massively overtaken, right? Uh, so it was kind of a nice, um, period where there were no phone cameras and suddenly there was like one first Nokia phone with the camera built in and it was like, whoa, why do you need a camera on the phone? Like ridiculous, right? Uh, because people have digital cameras and they have phones. Uh, and then now this idea of having a camera in the phone is like, why would you have a phone without a camera, right? Uh, so it, it just happened over, I don't know, 15 years time uh, that, that completely people changed their mind about having a camera on the phone. Something which looked ridiculous at the early time uh, is common these days. Um, they are getting much better. So the sensors, the miniaturization and so on progressed. And this slide says that the phone cameras are still inferior to proper digital cameras. And that's true. Um, the digital cameras have bigger sensors, uh, but it's not as clear as it used to be, right? Uh, the DSLRs are still bigger, bulkier, and they have bigger sensors, but you have a lot of digital cameras which are kind of the same uh, size as uh, phones often. They're kind of small and compact, and they do use those very tiny CMOS sensors as well, right? So. Um, it, it kind of depends, your mileage may vary, but most DSLR, those proper uh, digital um, reflex cameras, they will have a sensor which is bigger, especially those called full, uh, full size sensors, uh, which are like uh, 36 by 24 millimeters. Uh, those are very superior to anything else uh, because they have, um, it's not necessarily about the resolution, about the uh, amount of uh, photo elements that you can squeeze on a larger area is just the amount of light that gets there, right? If you have area which kind of uh, is lit by the lens, which is bigger, you get much more light, which means you get much more information to process than on a very tiny sensor, right? So just by the nature of the amount of light that you're getting, you can have more uh, quality images uh, on the larger sensors. Um, and and it's the same for the uh, the resolution. So because you have less pixels, it doesn't mean the quality of the image is, is worse. It may actually be better because even with the smaller number of pixels, you can uh, recognize much more information from the larger area than on the smaller sensor of the of the uh, camera, for example. Um, so what we can do with the, um, with the camera, we can do video processing, we can do image processing, we can apply filters, we can use some creative way of using augmented reality, which means we use the phone to see through the image, the video see through, and render some digital images on top to have kind of an added content. Um, <clears throat> and Remember about open computer vision library. Uh, it's very useful and it provides a lot of uh, processing for tracking and for uh, simple uh, manipulation of, of live images. So yeah, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting domain. We will talk a little bit about it in a, in a minute. Um, so yeah, some trivia. Um, so if in the early days, the phones were not as powerful as they are now. So some of the image processing had to be done on the server side. So we used to transfer images to the servers to do some of the processing there and send the results back, right? Um, so I, I don't know whether you remember, there was a project called Google Gla Goggles and there was um, like, um, um, you can point your phone add to something and it will kind of recognize the, the object and kind of tell you what it is or, you know, where you can find it in the shop or whatever, right? 
So it was an app which was taking an image, sending it to Google, analyzing what it is, recognizing it, and sending some info back to you with some links or whatever, right? Um, yeah, it, it probably still exists. I, I, I haven't used it for, for a couple of years. But it was kind of like the still frame transfer. So it was capturing an image, sending it somewhere, processing, and so on. Um, you can do most of the time processing on the device itself. Most phones are multi-core these days. They have very powerful GPUs. Um, and you can do a lot of heavy duty processing directly on the, on the device. The side effect is power consumption. So if you have to do a lot of it, uh, you know, you will drain the battery. Um, and there is always this balance of how much you want to do on the device and how much you can do in the cloud. Um, so it's a kind of a cost benefit ratio for the cloud. You have to have network. You have to have network usage. You have to have data transfer over the network. If it's Wi-Fi, it's okay. If it's a kind of a 3G, well, you have to incur potentially some costs. Um, and for processing locally, you need storage and the, the battery consumption, right? Um, so um, <clears throat> we, uh, I haven't tested it uh, like with the recent uh, Android API. Uh, with the latest one, but it used to be the case that you, uh, when you're capturing the image, you have to be displaying uh, the the image on the screen as well. So you, it was kind of wired in such a way that you cannot do image processing from the camera, live image processing from the camera, if you don't show what you're doing on the screen. Uh, you could use some tricks. You can minimize the, you know, the the camera preview just to one pixel, right? Uh, so, but it was kind of uh, f f potentially for security reasons uh, done in such a way that image processing from the camera has to be done with the live uh, pre preview. Um, and it, it runs, you know, reasonable uh, frame rate. It depends on the resolution. If you take the highest resolution picture, uh, then it may be slow. It may be 10 frames per second or something like this. Uh, if you take, you know, a smaller resolution image, it will be really fast. Uh, and then you can process the, uh, the video stream on the device. Um, it's not that slow anymore, but for some applications, it might be too slow. Uh, and then we have GPUs. So the technology moved forward and we kind of invested a lot of time into um, making the capabilities for augmented reality kind of possible. So uh, especially ARM uh, manufacturer, they, they spend a lot of R&D time on um, improving the capabilities of the um, mobile GPUs, uh, and they can do processing really fast. Why it is important? Well, it is important because for augmented reality, what has to happen is you kind of seeing the image through the camera, right? So the camera re registers the image from the scene, gets it to the phone, and now I need to augment what I see with some images, you know, artificially generated. So let's say I want to put something on this table. I have to recognize of where the table is and where my phone is in relation to that table. And I will do that using the, the video see-through and some feature tracking. So I have to be processing the all the frames really fast, recognizing where my device is in relation to the image, uh, and then projecting the particular object of what I want to augment uh, into the real image. And it has to happen really fast, so when I'm interacting with it, it feels natural. It doesn't, it's not laggy and, and so on, right? And this registration of where my camera is in relation to the table is quite computationally intensive, and it has to happen really fast. Um, so, um, there were some experiments with stereoscopic cameras. Uh, what the stereoscopic camera would do is you have two lenses instead of one. So if you imagine that you have two lenses and you know exactly what is the distance between one lens and the other, if I take two pictures, then I can calculate how far something is from me because I will have a small shift. It's like the same as we perceive distance from our visual system, right? We have two eyes and they are shifted, um, you know, sideways. 
So then we see slightly different image from one, one eye and from the other. And this difference between those two images, my, our brain uh, interprets as the distance to the object, right? So if something is really far away, the distance is very small, uh, the, the, the difference between one eye and the other. If something is small, um, if something is close to me, then the distance is really big. And the brain very quickly learns how to recognize the distance and can do that. So like if you, if you hide one eye and try to walk, you will quickly notice that your sense of distance is gone. You kind of don't judge distance well anymore, right? Um, so with the camera with two lenses, we would be able to do the same. We would be able to judge distance to objects really well, right? But it's a little bit costly uh, to have two cameras in the phone. So most phones don't have it. Um, but for some uh, experimentations, we try that. We try to have depth sensing cameras or depth sensing systems such that we can judge the distance to, uh, to objects, right? And what it means, like for example, if I, um, if I want to judge uh, where my phone is in relation to the table, um, I do the, the snapshots and then by judging the movements of my hand and the shaking of the hand and different um, kind of the positions of the phone when taking the image, I can judge like what the phone changed in relation, like what the or, uh, position of the phone changed in relation to the scene that the phone looks at, right? Uh, if I have the depth, uh, even if the phone is stationary, I can see how far the table is from the phone, right? Uh, if I don't have the depth, I have to kind of uh, move the phone a little bit to get enough information to be able to judge from, um, you know, Pythagoras theorem of where the phone is in relation to the scene that I'm looking at. Uh, so augmented reality on a normal phone is a little bit challenging because this distance judging is quite slow and um, not, not slow, it's quite, you know, difficult. Um, so what Google did, Google has um, a special um, device, a special project where they've built in uh, depth sensing capabilities into the de mobile device and that gives them kind of a, a better precision of uh, judging of where the phone is in space, right? Um, you you can you can use it for slam yeah so you can use this technology for for slam if you want to um th this is a, a pretty long talk so i will pause it for a moment um i will change the sound output so the link is the link is in the slides um and you can uh, you can watch it. Yeah. No sound. Yeah. Anyway, uh, sound is not that important. Um, what I want to show you is um, what you can use it for. So. Um, You can, as I said before, you can use it to judge the distance, right? So I can uh, point at the scene and then because I have a kind of a depth sensing um, setup, I can judge exactly what is the distance from one point in space to another point in space because I know how far those points in space are from me, right? Uh, so if I'm kind of capturing um, the, the wall behind, I know exactly how far the edge of the wall is from me and how far this edge is. So then I know those two distances. Then I can calculate the other one based on the angles and the, yeah, the normal uh, triangle uh, equations, right? Um, so I can judge. I know how far this point is from me. I know how far this point is from me exactly. Then I can you know, calculate that distance between those two points uh, in space, in 3D space. Um, what else can I do? I get um, yeah, the give a number of examples. The best ones are at the, at the end. So, for example, um, you can use it to scan the room 
and get the uh, 3D information about the, the setup of the room. And you can recreate it like, let's say in Unity 3D or in some other 3D software package, right? So you can um, uh, scan the area and get kind of a detailed information of how the 3D space looks like because you're getting all the information about the, um, yeah, so th this is what, what you uh, were asking, whether you can do slam with it, right? So you, at the same time, register the space around you as, as they are doing right now. So you're getting all the information about all the pixels, all the depths that you have around, and um, you can do localization. <coughs> Sorry. You can do localization exactly where you are in that space, right? So you registering the space and you kind of uh, knowing exactly where you are. Um, so this is another example where you can um, detect people with, you know, um, orientation invariant uh, setup. So it doesn't mean that doesn't matter like how you orient the device. Um, you can also remove furniture, right? So this on the left, what you see is you see the room like a, a normal room. And on the right, you see the camera see-through, which removes the objects which you don't want to see in the room. And it approximates the, the missing part of the data based on the data that it's there, right? So I know that the picture sticks out a little bit from the wall, so I can remove the picture from the wall uh, and just replace it with the, you know, the image like the... Uh, uh, the image of the, the the wall which is next to the image. I can see that the computer is kind of in front of the wall and I can remove it as well. Uh, I have to fill in some data there because otherwise, you know, it, it would be empty, right? Like I, I removed some pixels so there is nothing to draw. So what I will do is I will reuse the, you know, the neighboring, neighboring pixels to kind of uh, propagate them into that empty space, right? Then the effect is, you basically have uh, a room which kind of uh, is recorded as if it was without any furniture, right? Uh, what you can do also, you can remove the furniture from the room and you can put different furniture in. So you see see through with the furniture actually placed in space. So if you walk around it, it's, it will be kind of uh, nicely sticking there uh, all the time. Here they've used it for uh, mapping the street um, and you can do, um, it, it is quite accurate. It's, uh, accurate to about a centimeter in, in space, right? So for example, if I, I use this device, um, oops, if I use this device here, so I start it and I walk around, I walk around the corridor and I come back here, uh, the device will know plus minus two or three centimeters of where it is based on the data that is registered, right? So it kind of uh, keeps the keeps track of the orientation quite precisely, much better than accelerometer or gyroscope, uh, and doesn't have the drift because it kind of uh, calibrates itself all the time from the from the image. And here they are kind of uh, using the uh, the same system for knowing of where the drone is and kind of navigating through the hole in the uh, in the box. Um, so it, it, it's, it's basically using the same tech to um, to detect where it is in space and what is the orientation in space, right? Uh, so for some augmented reality applications, this device is much, much more superior to the normal camera uh, because it detects very accurately of where it is in space. And we have uh, some of those devices here and some master students did some, some work on uh, detecting where the walls are and things like this. It, it kind of provides you kind of a cloud point of what is around you, but you have to do some processing and it's a bit noisy. As you've seen, uh, the images are, like if you're doing the, the registration, it's, you know, it's not perfect. Like you get the point cloud, but it's not super accurate. The resolution is still uh, somewhat limited. So you're not getting like a perfect uh, representation of all the objects you have kind of a rough representation. So even looking at the, yeah. So for example, even looking at the wall, if I was pointing this device at the wall, 
uh, the wall doesn't appear actually super flat. It appears a kind of a little bit bumpy. Uh, you have to flatten it software in software, right? So you have to kind of approximate. You have to detect, oh yeah, I think it's the wall. And then you have to kind of uh, smoothen it to one plane. So then it actually represents a single wall, right? So um, with, the, with things that are relatively uh, uh, shallow, like for example, the board, uh, it would be quite difficult to remove the board from the wall because the, the bumpiness is about half a centimeter uh, and then the, the board is probably one, one and a half, then it will kind of look as if it's part of the wall, right? Uh, it, it, it is not that, that trivial. But it's one of those um, potential um, technologies which may be used uh, later. Still producing those um, uh, depth sensing cameras is uh, a little bit challenging because of the legal reasons of patents and because it, it is just costly uh, process wise. All right, so let's do microphone and then we'll have a break. Uh, so another uh, standard sensors that we have is uh, is a microphone. And what you can do with microphone? Well, um, you can do a lot of different things. You can detect ambient sounds. You can detect if the phone is in the pocket or not. Uh, you can detect if, you, if you're outside or indoor. Uh, you can detect kind of a lot of things that you don't think about. Uh, but you can because, you know, there, there are different um, uh, sound artifacts that you're kind of experiencing. Um, there were a couple of projects which were using a microphone to detect kind of a noise pollution in the city. So the, the app was basically sampling um, the noise level at different parts of the city and uh, geolocate, geocoding them. Uh, so you can map particular locations with the level of noise. And then if multiple phones have the same readings, you can kind of highlight how some hotspots of some places in the city are very noisy, for example. Um, you can detect, uh, um, yeah, we had a game jam a uh, few weeks ago and the uh, student was uh, detecting kind of a beats and changing the water surface to kind of reflect the bounciness of the music. So you had kind of a flat, say, water container and it was bouncing, that the, like the water droplets were bouncing on the surface of the water depending on the music rhythm. Um, so you can do different things. Um, the, the data that you're getting is in a form of the amplitude readings. So it's like the wave format. Uh, and then you can trans translate it into the um, uh, frequency domain, or you can use some wavelet transformations to detect the beats and, and so on. Um, so and you have speakers. So you have kind of a microphone and speakers. And um, yeah, there, there are some uh, interesting use cases for both, for the speakers and for the microphone, because both of them are analog to digital. They use analog to digital converters. So there are some creative ways of actually encoding some things that is analog signal into digital and back, which may or may not be sound itself. Uh, so there were some uh, peripheral devices which you were plugging into your um, headphone jack for the phones which still had the jack. Uh, and um, you, you kind of could have uh, some interesting conversions between analog and digital signals. Uh, with modern phones, with the jack gone, uh, you only have digital input, right? I cannot plug anything analog into my phone anymore because I only have USB input in, right? So nothing analog can come in into the phone on a cable. I mean, I can talk to the phone. So the microphone is still analog, but there is nothing I can uh, plug in. Um, so that was kind of a big deal. Like people often don't talk about it, but removing the audio jack is not just removing an audio jack. It's also removing all those extra peripherals that you could have, uh, which use analog to digital conversion. Um, all right, so let's have a 10 minutes break and uh, we will continue with uh, GPS and how it works.
and I will finish my lunch.
It's normally there is no it, it is doing the super. No, it's not. <laughs> so in C++, if you don't call super, no. No. nothing will call it. But in Java, it will. If you even if you don't call it, it will be called anyway. Yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah. Yeah. 
<lacht> ja. Alright, so GPS. How does GPS work? Who can explain to me how GPS works? Yeah? Okay, sounds good. So let's kind of get down to it. Um, so let's say this is the surface of the Earth. Um, so what do we know? What do we need for it to work? We need, yeah, we need satellites. Okay. How many? Why are So how many? How many satellites do we need? the problem to one dimension okay uh, I am somewhere on the one dimensional line uh, how many uh, sensing devices do I need to have to be able to tell based on triangulation of where I am on the on the single line yeah yeah so Let's say I have the device one, device two, and then what we were saying is the device senses how far I am from that device, right? So I have the distance D from the device, but this distance is kind of on the circle, right? The, the device doesn't know where I am. It knows, oh yeah, you're one kilometer away from me, but somewhere around here, right? And that's what this device also knows. It says D2, D1, it knows, oh yeah, you are kind of somewhere around me here, right? Uh, so if we have a single line, one dimensional problem, uh, problem, two is enough because they will intersect on this line in one spot, right? So then the, these guys say, yeah, you must be here, right? Uh, where the intersection is. But if we expand it to 2D, what happens with 2D? So now I'm somewhere on this plane, and those two devices sense me, and I can be either here or over there. Yeah? Then, uh, uh, what the says is if you were on that line, you could have been up there. So. Well, so now I can. They also cross there. So. That's right. So now I can be either here or over here. They don't know, right? So how do we solve that? By introducing device three. 
right? If I introduce device three, and the device three senses me D3 from itself, then what will happen? There will be only one point will all those three circles cross, right? So I am here because this distance, this distance, and this distance cross each other in one spot, right? So for 2D, I eat three satellites. Okay, now we go into 3D. I am in the three-dimensional space, and those circles are not circles anymore, they are spheres, right? So what will happen with those three spheres? Exactly, yeah. That's right. So what happens now is I have this kind of extra thing happening where I can be anywhere around that extra dimension. And to change that, I need the fourth satellite, which also has the sphere, and then they will only cross in one spot. Right? Make sense? Um, okay, so um, good, so one, one more thing. Uh, there, was, there was one word mentioned. Uh, Triangulation. Triangulation. What is triangulation? Yeah. Okay, let's let's get back to two D um, or even one D. Um, so let's say I'm on the on that line somewhere. Uh, so I have the sensing device which senses that I am somewhere along that thing, and I have okay, my line is not like that. Yeah, but you get the idea, right? I have another sensing device, and then uh, we measuring the this distance and this distance, and what else do we need to measure? Can I calculate where I am based on those two distances? Not really. I need to know I need to know exactly where these guys are. Right? Uh, if I don't know exactly where these guys are, I cannot do that. Right? So if I know exactly where they are, and I know this distance, then um, I can calculate where I am, right? Based on the knowledge of where they are. So with satellites, that's how it works. Like the satellites change information, they, they're usually geostationary, so they know exactly where they are, and they know exactly how long it takes to propagate the signal, so they can they calculate the, the distances uh, between the the things, and they can uh, calculate of where particular point is. Right? This process is not called triangulation. This process is called trilateration. Okay. It's often mistaken one for the other. The other one is. You don't know where they are. You know what this angle is, right? If I know those angles, I don't need to know where they are. I can calculate where this point is because I can take it from the, uh, you know, some sort of uh, um, triangle uh, equations to calculate if I know the distance and the angle I can calculate the missing parts, right? I may need to know how high they are, right? So if I know how high they are and I know the angle, I can calculate where certain things are. But I don't need to know exact location of, of where they are. And this is triangulations because I'm using the triangle equations to calculate where things are in space, right? 
such as a small, uh, uh, you know, small difference from one to the other, right? Um, where else do we use this? So let's say I have a 2D space again, and um, I don't have GPS signal. What else can I use to locate a phone? Cell phone towers, exactly, great. So I have a cell phone uh, towers, right? And uh, I have a device somewhere, and then device may, does handshakes with the cell phone towers, right? Why do we do this handshakes with the cell phone towers? What's the main purpose of why the phone is always talking to the cell phone towers? There is one term that you also need to know for the exam. So I will tell you the term. It's called end over. What does it mean? Have you heard that term before? So I am somewhere in space uh, and uh, Bob calls me and I pick the phone and I'm talking with Bob, right? Um, what happens? Well, you know, Bob is somewhere and his signal, uh, so Bob talks over his phone uh, and his signal goes to the network and it gets propagated to the cell tower which talks to me, right? Uh, so through Bob, I'm talking through this cell tower to Bob. I'm not talking to Bob through this cell tower. I'm talking to Bob through this cell tower, right? Because that's the closest to me, right? Let's say I'm kind of here. And this cell tower is the one which I'm using to talk to Bob, right? And now I get into a car and I'm driving and I'm still talking to Bob, right? And at some point, I'm kind of here and the signal to this cell tower is going weak and the signal to that straight cell tower is getting strong. And these two guys have to decide which one will be used for me to talk to Bob. This is kind of like a network of cell towers, which Bob is using one to get into the network, and then the network decides how the signal goes, right? If you're talking on the internet, you always have one internet port through which your signal goes. You don't have like multiple ones with the same information. You just have one. It's the same here. One cell tower talks to me to pass the signal to Bob. But if I'm in a car and I'm driving, at some point in time, a magic happens. And the magic is that these two guys negotiate with each other and at some point they say, we have to do handover, we have to hand over your phone, your connection from this cell tower to this one. And suddenly I'm talking to Bob over this cell tower, not the old one, right? So I'm driving in the car, I'm talking to Bob and I'm talking to Bob over that cell tower. And I haven't noticed that, right? It's magic. And it's magic because it's so complicated to do that nobody realizes like how, how, how magical it is. Uh, it requires your phone and those two cell towers to synchronize themselves to the point that at a particular time slot, at a particular millisecond, this one stops working and this one starts working, right? Uh, and I'm kind of handover. So this handover process is the reason why I'm always talking to all the neighboring uh, cell towers to establish which one is the poss possible next one for me to jump onto, to be hand over to, right? Uh, and they all the time do that. They kind of uh, talk to me, oh yeah, how far you are, how, what are you doing? Like, are you moving towards me? No, okay, great, then blah, 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 right? So if we're using cell towers and they are kind of establishing the, si the signal strength, they can kind of estimate how far you are from them, right? Based on the signal strength that they use. And this, again, it forms kind of like this distance measure, right? So they have this kind of, a, if I have another one here, I have this distance measure happening all the time. And because of those distance measures, the network can kind of locate me of where I am in space and what is happening with me. Do I move this direction or this direction and so on? Um, so we're using uh, trilateration again for locating me in the, uh, 
in space using the cell towers too. So even if you turn your GPS off, you still have location services based on the um, cell towers, right? Um, you have some problems here, uh, same as with GPS. So what, what inhibits GPS usage? Where GPS doesn't work or works, you know, poorly? Yeah, on the moon. <laughs> but on Earth, uh, what inhibits it? Yeah. If you don't have a clear view of the sky, if you're indoor, if you're in a thick forest, uh, you know, that inhibits the use of GPS. What inhibits the cell tower use? Same. Um, you also have some um, uh, electromagnetic reflections, like over some metal constructions or walls, things like that. Uh, in some urban areas, you have a very high density of cell towers. So the accuracy of the location based on cell towers might be better than from GPS, especially if you have tall buildings in the like urban area. But if you go outside, the cell towers are spread every 10, 15 kilometers. They are very sparse. And then the location based on uh, cell towers is much worse than GPS, right? Um, so it, it, it kind of depends. Um, so uh, the same you can do with Wi-Fi, right? Uh, we had a project uh, two or three years ago where uh, students were mapping what they can see in terms of Wi-Fi uh, stations in different rooms of the of the campus, and then they you know um, recorded this kind of a small database of all the G uh, not GPS the Wi-Fi. Uh, signatures and then if, if you take your phone in a particular room based on the wi-fi that you can see and the strength they could tell you yeah you're in uh, a 255 because that's what it looks like if you are in a 255 you see those wi-fi uh, signals that particular way right um, so you can kind of use uh, wi-fi uh, as well to uh, establish uh, location I had another student uh, back in New Zealand who was working on uh, using Wi-Fi to locate um, uh, devices in space with like a small area. So he had like four different Wi-Fi stations and he was using the signal strength to locate of where in that space a, a device was. Uh, and it, it can provide relatively good accuracy. Um, all right, so um, what do you have to consider? Yeah, user movement. Uh, you have to check how frequently the user moves. Like if the user walks, it's different than if the user is in the car. Uh, so if, you, if the user walks and you check the location every five seconds, it is still very accurate within a couple of meters. But if the user drives, you know, 80 kilometers per hour, uh, then suddenly your error is like 100 of meters uh, because you don't know what has happened uh, within five seconds, for example. Um, and then you have also the dilemmas with the um, um, visibility of the satellites. Some satellites come into view, some disappear from view, and the accuracy may differ from uh, recording to recording. Um, yes, so this word trilateration is kind of uh, used here. Uh, the, um, it says it's not very accurate, uh, but in some urban areas, you really have a lot of cell towers and they can uh, localize you quite well. Uh, so it, it's sometimes it is quite accurate. Um, so with better coverage, you have... Um, uh, yeah, you have better accuracy. So what can you use the location for in the in the application? What do you use location for? Yeah. So you can use it for some commercial purposes, like to track what are the hot spots, what are the 
uh, locations which user frequently uh, matches, uh, visits. Um, you can use it for navigation. Most of you probably use it for navigation, yeah? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, on, on phones, on the modern Android, you can also enable location based security. So, for example, you can tag your home to be a secure location. So, your phone unlocks every time you're at home. You don't have to type your PIN every single time. But if you leave your home, uh, it will require you to authenticate uh, every time you turn your screen off, right? Uh, well, you know, how safe it is? Well, if you kind of alone at, at home and there is nobody else to pick your phone at home, then it's okay. But that is a bit of a security vulnerability, right? Uh, because if someone picks your phone at home, in your home, uh, then it's a bit open, right? Um, <clears throat> right, uh, what else did we use location for? Uh, we worked with the... Um, uh, we worked with uh, like a retirement village uh, and it was quite big. It was a couple of hectares of uh, residential area and people there, there were elderly people living there and some of them had dementia and so on, but they, they wanted the patients to have like a freedom of movement, right? So they were equipped with like a bracelet and um, the, the bracelet was tracking their locations and if they were around the area, it was okay. But as long as they kind of crossed some sort of geofenced area, there was a nurse, nurses were getting a signal that someone was wandering off the, you know, the park or whatever, right? So you can use it for geofencing. Uh, it's used for gaming, like uh, Pokemon Go is a good example of a location-based kind of a game system, which uses locations for um, the game mechanic. Um, you can do various things with, with the location. Um, it is kind of interesting that the cell tower location was known for many years before the phones were equipped with GPS. So all the phones, all their phones were also able to use the location services. And uh, uh, operators, network operators, they were wondering how to, how to monetize it, how to offer some services that they could earn money on people developing apps using location on the old phones. Uh, and they never really worked it out. Uh, and then the modern phones happened. Um, uh, the GPS kind of happened. And you had this explosion of different apps which are using location for various things, for free mostly. Uh, and the, the, this kind of yeah innovativeness happened, right? Uh, and it completely bypassed the network operators. Uh, and they were kind of upset that they had this data for years, they didn't know what to do with it, and they never did anything, and they kind of missed the train, right? Um, so that is kind of interesting from both sociology and kind of a business models uh, perspective, that you have those forces at work which sometimes kind of uh, are counterintuitive. Uh, because if they opened it up, it would have been used years earlier uh, for various things. All right, so then... Um, Software-wise, how do we use it? As I said, it's relatively straightforward. You have a class called Sensor Manager, and you use it for listing all the sensors that you have on the device. Uh, you can register and under-register some of the listeners using that class, uh, and you kind of can use it directly to acquire some uh, orientation uh, information. Then you have a class representing the actual individual sensor. So you will have a temperature sensor, you will have the accelerometer, you will have a gyroscope, uh, you know, a pressure sensor, whatnot. And then you can uh, obtain some information or some additional API through a particular sensor class representing a particular sensor. Then you have sensor event. Again, in Android, it's not uh, super type safe. It's basically a sensor event is shared between different uh, sensors and what it gives you, it gives you a timestamp of when the event happened and it gives you an array of floats, right? So what you say, what is an array of floats for a temperature sensor? Well, it will be an array of floats with just one element, which is the temperature, right? 
what's the array of floats for an accelerometer? Well, it will be an array of floats with X, Y, Z coordinates for the different dimensions, similar for the gyroscope, right? For pressure, it will be probably the reading of the, uh, just the pressure, right? So what if the answer is uh, integer? Well, it will be a float. You just cast it to the integer, right? Uh, what if it's not a number? Well, it uh, kind of happened that it's always a number. If it's a Boolean, like a proximity sensor is just, either you have zero or one, it's just zero or one, right? So they kind of uh, didn't use a very complex event mechanism. They just used the timestamp class array of floats, right? Um, you could do more tricks. You could do it more type safe. You could have different types of events per different sensor. But because this simple event type covers most use cases that you can think of, it kind of is like that. And then to understand what those values for the, for the array mean, you have to check the documentation, right? Um, and then you have a concept of the event listener. So same as with the you know, buttons for like key, press, event, and so on, you basically have a callback. So it's exactly the same as with any other event-based system. You have a callback, callback which uh, um, yeah, notifies you that a particular event happened. Um, so in code, it looks like this. You usually have uh, a sensor manager, which you instantiate. You obtain it from the service. Um, so you say get system service. Uh, and then you can list all the sensors that you have. You can write yourself a very simple app, which checks on your phone what sensors you have and kind of shows you all the sensors. You probably have seen apps like that on the App Store, on the Google Play. Um, and then if you want a particular sensor, you request it from the sensor manager and you either get it or you don't, right? If your device have that sensor, you will succeed. Uh, if you don't, you, you know, you, you don't have it. Um, and then uh, when you are um, writing the uh, listener, you have um, some events that happen which notify you of what is happening with the sensor. So for example, for some sensors, uh, you will have an event called accuracy changed. You will get it for GPS, for example. Every time a new satellite pops up and the GPS can accurate, more accurately identify where your location is, you will have an accuracy changed event. Every time some satellites go out of view, uh, you will have an accuracy change that uh, your accuracy is worse, right? Most of the time you will ignore it. Uh, you don't need to deal with it every, for every single sensor. And some sensors don't have those, right? Accelerometer will not have it. Uh, accelerometer will have always the same accuracy. Um, but some sensors like GPS will vary the accuracy and then you will get notified. Um, and then some things have this. Again, temperature, accelerometer, and so on don't have sensor changed, but location do, right? So the user may disable GPS, and then the phone may switch to the cell tower's location in, for uh, um, updates about um, your location. Or you may have you know, some additional um, event happening on the system, so you will get notified on that. Um, and then you register the particular listener, uh, and you specify the frequency at which you want to be notified about the events. Right, each sensor will have a particular sensor delay as constant, and you can specify um, what is the frequency that you want to be used. And then you have a call for unregistering the listener when you're done. Usually doing it on post, so you're not pulling polling the requests uh, from the sensor all the time. Um, and this is the. Um, uh, manifest change, you will add that, you know, your app is using accelerometer and then uh, you can specify if that feature is required or not. If you say true, that means phones without accelerometer will not be able to install your app. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, before I continue with this quickly, um, I... Yeah, so let me just go back for the listener. Um, 
So one very important thing for the event listener is that this code that you are providing for, um, yeah, um, yeah, I don't have the the uh, the callback here, but it it will be like a, a method that you're overwriting, uh, which will, um, yeah, so like this one. So this one is the whoops. This one is called every time the new event happens, right? For the uh, and you get the sensor event in as a parameter to this call, and then you are reading. So this one is, for example, um, yeah, it's a light sensor, presumably because you're reading just value zero. Uh, so in this code here, you're not supposed to do much of a processing because that happens very quickly. And every time, and, and, and those notifications happen on the same thread. So if you are very slow here, suddenly your processing speed will drop down because, you know, the time you take to do this will be the time you reduce from getting the, the, the updates, right? So you have to plan uh, how you're going to deal with it. And the usual pattern is that you get the, your data, you store it in a buffer, and you quit this method. And you have a different thread which processes the buffer depending what you need to do with it, right? So you're not supposed to be processing the data in here. You're supposed to only be storing it uh, or passing it somewhere and be processing the data in some other thread um, that you can control. Um, so you, you should keep that in mind. All right, so uh, as this says, don't block the on sensor change method, right? So you have to... Um, um, make sure that this implementation for the event processing is kind of as efficient as possible and you're getting things done in an additional thread. Uh, and here you're only passing the data to some buffer and that's it. You're basically copying the data somewhere. Um, you should avoid using deprecated methods. Um, you should verify the errors and how the sensor behaves before you use them. Uh, and you should choose the sensor delay to reflect what your usage pattern is um, to avoid being um, uh, to, to avoid doing too much uh, battery drainage than necessary. Right. So, a um, couple of slides about the camera. Um, you can access the camera through the built-in camera app. So you can uh, initiate uh, an intent and let the user take the photo with the default app or the app of their choice, right? So that's the simplest way to capture the still image without doing any work yourself. Uh, you can use the um, API to initiate the capture of the image yourself. So you can programmatically take the uh, image uh, from the camera. Um, and then you can use the surface view, which represents the uh, live camera preview on the screen. As I said, uh, in early Android, you had to have it uh, used. Otherwise, you couldn't process the camera uh, feed. Uh, I, I think it might be still the case. Um, you can also record the video using the media recorder. That's another option. Uh, and you have to specify um, that you need to use the camera either in the manifest file or request the permission to use the camera from the user. Uh, when you before you you can actually use it, um, so um, you're declaring same as with the location. You're declaring uh, that you are using location or the camera, and you're declaring what sort of features like is it a fine location or is it a coarse location, and so on. Fine location usually means GPS. Uh, coarse location means uh, cell tower or other approximation of of your location. Uh, if you're using camera, you have to use storage permissions as well because the image needs to be stored somewhere. Uh, so usually um, you will request the camera permissions with the storage permissions. Um, yeah, so if you're recording video and you want to record the microphone or audio, you know, together with the video, you have to request the audio recording permission. It's a separate permission because uh, you may just be recording uh, just video with, with no sound. Uh, and then if you want to tag the uh, images with the GPS data, 
you have to ask for the location permissions as well. <coughs> so this is how you <coughs> generate the image capture um, intent. So we're basically specifying here that we need a new intent, which will be uh, action of image capture. Um, we specifying where the file should be stored, and then we um, starting the activity for result. And what it will do, it will open the camera app of choice of the user and allow the user to either cancel it or record an image, right? Um, and then this is what will happen for the on activity result. So we kind of now getting the data back uh, from the capture that we've done. So those are kind of a example code snippets of how to use the built-in camera app to capture an image and, and uh, do something with it. Um, yeah, it's, it's already four o'clock. Um, so I will kind of stop here. There are, there are just few more slides about using the um, uh, location and how to deal with the um, with the map view. Um, so some of, of you might choose a project which will use uh, Google Maps or OpenStreetMap view. Um, I don't remember if we have a separate lecture on the... Yeah, so almost covered, right? <laughs> yeah, well, so we will see. Um, yeah, using location itself is exactly the same as with any other sensor. Uh, using maps is a little bit different. So with the maps, you are using kind of a maps API where you're kind of manipulating either the uh, shapes or some paths, and you can kind of manipulate the zooming out, zooming in, the layers, and so on. It's a little bit more complex. But with the location updates, it's basically the same as with the any other sensor updates. So there is a listener, and you get notified um, either by time or by distance, right? So you can get the notification about the location change either by particular time that I want every five seconds, or you can say I want every 20 meters to be notified that the, the user is in the different location, right? If the user is within the same 10 meter radius or something, I don't need to be notified, right? So you can pick one or the other uh, for being updated about the location. All right, so that's it for now. Questions? Great, so thank you very much. And if you have any ideas for the sensor-based uh, app that is fun, uh, share it, and then we will think something of we will think something up.